So welcome to tonight's public lecture by Sharon Bagwin rolls uh, hosted by the ANU Gender Institute. My name is Katrina Lee Koo and I'm a member of the Gender Institute here at the ANU and a senior lecturer in international relations. Before we get started tonight, it's my very great pleasure to introduce the convener of the Gender Institute, Dr. Fiona Jenkins, who will say a few words. Well, I'd first like to um, acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay respect to the elders of the Ngunnawal people, past and present. Um, this public lecture, which I'm very happy to welcome you all to tonight, is following an extraordinary day of discussion that we've just had at the Great Hall of University House um, around the National Action Plan for Women, Peace and Security. And, of course, the National Action Plan is very, very important because of the way in which it places concerns about um, gender, puts a gender perspective at the heart of considerations of security and peace. And um, the National Action Plan, of course, is, is particularly um, exciting at the moment in the context of Australia's um, place in the Security Council. Um, it carries the burden of implementing the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325, which basically recognises the experiences of women and girls can be very different in conflict from the experiences of men and boys, and the needs in post-conflict situations can also be extremely different, and um, pays particular attention to um, human rights violations that are um, sexual and gender-based violences. So it also, I think, very crucially underlines the importance of promoting women's full involvement and participation in all understandings of, of conflict and how um, post-conflict um, solutions are, are reached. So women's full participation in, in peace processes is, is called for under this resolution. Now, um, it's been very exciting for the Gender Institute over the last few weeks um, to be working with UN Women Australia, with the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, or WILPF, um, with the Australian Council for International Development, um, to bring together um, key players from government, from NGOs, from civil society more broadly, academics and students, um, in this wonderful day in which um, the uh, success to date of the implementation of the plan, issues arising around it have been discussed and debated. And we're hoping that this is a, the first of a whole series of annual civil dialogues that will really um, keep the pressure on and make sure that the commitment to the voices of women and girls that's recognised in this resolution is really sustained and involved through the efforts of civil society. Now, the ANU Gender Institute was only established um, two years ago, and I think it's fair to say that we've already become a, a vital hub for sharing information and resources and creating a network in the national capital. And indeed, this particular collaboration, this very exciting day, reflects that um, emphasis on creating a sense of community, um, not only among academics at ANU, important for us, um, but also between academics and policymakers and activists. And I hope that if you're not already signed up to receive our newsletter, you'll sign up today and get a lot of fantastic news about what's going on. Um, many of you might be interested in coming to an event that we're organising next Monday with Vocal Majority, which is very much aimed at getting young people involved and interested in the women's rights agenda. So um, I think some details of that are coming up on the website. Um, it's a fantastic privilege and honour tonight to have our speaker, um, Sharon Bagwan rolls who's agreed to share with us some of her thoughts about the implementation of 1325 from the perspective of women's rights advocates in the Pacific. And I'll hand over again to my colleague, Kately Koo, to introduce her more fully. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Fiona. So as Fiona said, it's our very great pleasure uh, on behalf of the Gender Institute to welcome Sharon bagwin rolls here tonight to give this evening's public lecture. Sharon has a very long and very distinguished history of advocacy for women, peace and security in the Pacific region. 
Currently, Sharon is the Executive Director of FemLink Pacific, Media Initiatives for Women. And FemLink Pacific is an organisation that use, uses community-based media to try to create spaces for women to be able to talk and for women to be able to participate in decision-making and discussions around issues of women, peace and security. And since 2007, FemLink has been heavily involved in convening the regional women's uh, media and policy network. But what Sharon will talk about tonight, and, and more specifically, is her work in the last year or so being involved in the drafting, the development and the launching of a regional action plan for women, peace and security in the Pacific. So it's my very great pleasure to welcome Sharon to talk on tonight's topic, which is linking women, peace and security in the Pacific, thinking globally and acting locally. Thanks, Sharon. <clears throat> Naka. Um, thank you for the introduction and I'd also like to start by acknowledging the traditional landowners of where we are meeting, past and present. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint, but you can go to our Facebook page, it's really cool, um, and we also have a very good website. Um, the presentation tonight is adapted from a contribution to a collection of papers uh, for rethinking peacekeeping Gender Perspectives and Collective Security, which will be published by Pluto. And I thought, rather than trying to say something new, it's always important to add to the ongoing advocacy and lobby for the implementation of 1325. So it will have a regional context. It will talk about the work towards the development of the regional action plan, but it will also draw on the type of work that we've been doing in, the, in, in Fiji as well as in the Pacific. In the Pacific region, women have been greatly marginalized from formal decision-making structures as a result of the predominantly patriarchal governance structures from the time of colonial administrations and continuing after independence. Yet despite such obstacles in Bougainville and Solomon Islands as well as Fiji, Women were instrumental in brokering peace during the height of crises and continue to play a vital role in building and sustaining peace in their communities. This has reflected our hope for peace, security, and political stability in our region. When it comes to notions of traditional security, women remain invisible. This practice continues despite the fact that women around the world, including the Pacific Island region, have been instrumental and often the most trusted group by both sides of a conflict. As such, women have often been the first negotiators for a ceasefire. Women have often paved the way for UN and regional peacekeeping and peace support operations. Yet even as women participate in these processes, peacekeeping and uh, post-conflict processes continue to subsequently exclude women. Women are often combatants during conflict, but I'd say that from some of the documentation I undertook in Bougainville, quite often the invisible combatants as well. And if they're not, they're certainly the wives, partners, or daughters of combatants, and therefore have an acute stake in the processes of disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration programs. Women have also been caught in the crossfire of war and armed conflicts through sexual exploitation, including the use of rape as a weapon of war. Women have also borne the brunt of sexual exploitation by the very people assigned the task of upholding peace and human rights. On the 31st of October in 2000, the UN Security Council unanimously passed Resolution 1325. It was the first resolution ever to be passed by the Security Council that specifically addresses the impact of war on women and women's contributions to conflict prevention and sustainable peace. 1325 remains a watershed for collective security because it demonstrated what is possible when the UN, member states and women's civil society collaborate. The resolution also signalled a shift in the role of women from victims to critical change agents in conflict prevention, management and peace building. This happened because 1325 not only focused on the protection of women in crisis situations, but also called for the effective participation of women in conflict prevention, resolution, and peace building. 
the mainstreaming of gender equality in peacekeeping missions, and called for the UN to appoint women into strategic positions related to peace and security. The focus of the resolution is on three pillars. Participation, identifying the important role of women in prevention and resolution of conflict and peace building, and post-conflict re uh, recovery, and the need to increase their role in decision making. The second pillar is peacekeeping and recognizes the urgent need to mainstream a gender perspective into peacekeeping operations and provides specialized training to military, police and civilians as part of peacekeeping operations on the protection and human rights needs of women in conflict situations. The third pillar is protection, acknowledging women and children account for the vast majority of those adversely affected by armed conflict including high levels of sexual violence. This has a consequent impact on durable peace and reconciliation. In the Pacific, as well as at the global level, unequal power relations, intolerance, lack of respect and valuing, lack of access to and control over resources, characterize the position of women relative to men. This fuels the pervasive nature of violence and the exclusion, marginalization, and invisibility of women at all levels of decision making, which is detrimental to the human security of the entire Pacific region. So my presentation is informed by the efforts of Pacific activists who belong to our Women's Media and Policy Network on 1325, which include the Leitana Nehan Women's Development Agency, Voice Belong Mere Solomons and Mafafine Moi family of Tonga. Our network uses community media as a platform to communicate and integrate 1325 into the regional and national peace and security architecture. We focus on four countries in the Pacific, Bougainville, Fiji, Solomon Islands and Tonga. As well as supporting the knowledge, we provide, um, our network pr uh, provides um, media and uses media as a mechanism for mobilizing women. Our paper will also um, link, to, well, my paper will also link to the recent work as alluded to earlier on the Regional Working Group on Women, Peace and Security, um, which has resulted in the development of the Regional Action Plan. I think it's also important to note that in the context of peacekeeping, at some level, like in Bougainville, they, they had peacekeepers after the war. In Tonga, after the riots, people were peacekeepers were, or peace support operations were called in. And in Fiji, we have been a troop contributing country. So we've experienced the presence of peacekeepers in our communities. Yet in every situation, including when Ramsey was mobilized in response to the armed conflict in the Solomon Islands in 2000, Women were not consulted on the nature of the tour of duty, the deployment of peacekeeping, or the peace process. In fact, while women contributed to the informal lead up to peace building, the very critical stage, they were never part of these formal processes. And as for the Fiji Islands, even though women have paved the way in the peace movement, we have been marginalized from many of the, init of the initial official interventions more recently since the December 6 military coup, 2006. Fiji has also been a troop and police contributing country to the UN since the mid 70s, providing personnel to the UN assistance mission to the Middle East and more recently to Iraq. Peacekeepers are the fathers, sons and brothers of women who remain at home, taking on the responsibilities of the family and community and increasingly peacekeepers are women. Since the formation of our network, we've reaffirmed the application of 1325 in the context of peacekeeping, that it's not just about recruiting and arming women. In fact, from our perspective, 1325 is about the support for the disbandment of military structures and enabling and supporting armed combatants to return to civilian life. Our work connects women to policy and political commitments through community media and our approach is helping women make linkages between faith values and human rights standards and assist them in articulating their peace and human security priorities. Just a little bit of the background of Femlink. We're one of the younger sisters of the Pacific feminist movement. 
We only emerged from the Blue Ribbon Peace Vigil Initiative, which was a response by those of us living in Suva at the time of the May 2000 crisis. So we emerged recognizing that while we had created a space for women and, and the families of the hostages to gather together in 2000, there was much more to be done to transform a society with the full and active participation of women in leadership positions. This, as in many conflict situations experienced in our region, also required us to work across the traditional ethnic and political barriers, while also considering the need for the transformation of our own broader women's movement. The founding collective of FemLink recognized that while we received media coverage of our peace uh, efforts, during the height of the 56-day um, hostage crisis and had had a series of formal dialogue and engagement with traditional leaders and the military council in 2000, there remained stereotypical and patriarchal approach, the rules of engagement when it came to dialogue for peace, including by the international community. This required us to maintain a visibility of women's peace efforts, not available in the media spaces but also by creating our own media to provide women with the space to discuss our issues and provide our recommendations. We were grounding our work in um, Section J, one of the sections of the <coughs> UN policy document, the Beijing Platform for Action. And at that time, as we were evolving as an organization, we received um, a message from a woman by the name of Anne Walker, who was working in New York at the time when the Women's Civil Society Network with WILP and other organizations were mobilizing by around 1325. Anne had worked in Fiji, helping set up the YWCA, and was actually one of the key women involved in drafting this specific uh, policy on women in the media. So she knew exactly what we were talking about, which was rather nice, because quite often people don't get it. Um, and so she said, OK, I can understand women in the media, fine, but you've now got 1325, so connect your media work to 1325. So like good girls, we listened. No, seriously, we got it too, and so we did. So community media for us has become an enabling and participatory process to empower and transform and inform the transformation of our own political spaces and processes, including, as I said earlier, within our own movements and organizations. We believe that Pacific women must be assisted in being innovative, not simply accepting the status quo, but demanding a transformation so that governments, the broader civil society and faith organizations are held accountable to their commitments to human rights, gender equality, development and peace. But assistance can never be top down. The FemLink Pacific Media Strategy centers on creating a space for women to communicate and hear other women, enlarging women's political voice and consciousness at the same time, particularly if you understand the context around ethnic divisions within Fiji as well. For us, the community media, including community radio, has been about bringing women together from the two major ethnic groups in particular to talk about common issues and not very and de very deliberately not dividing the media airtime or content according to ethnicity but by issues as defined by the women we believe local women's civil society representatives must be involved in helping to redefine and ensure implementation of the new human security agenda including through representation on local and national councils and committees addressing a broad range of security issues. What's very interesting right now is last year, the Pacific Forum leaders adopted, in addition to the Regional Action Plan, the Conflict Prevention and Human Security Framework. In Fiji, the, the conversation has stopped and started around human security, but we were advised by the Ministry of Defense a few weeks ago, the Human Security Framework is back on the agenda but they just don't know how to do 1325. Can you please help us? Okay, so we're gonna help them. Our work, and this is why, our work has brought voices of the marginalized and underrepresented into the political arena, particularly from grassroots communities, and to link to Pacific peace women's notions of peace, to advocate for a peace and security framework defined not just in military security, and political terms, but also in terms of human security, 
rooted in a combination of political, economic, personal, community and environmental factors. In fact, since the military coup in particular, for women to be able to talk about their priorities and setting their own agenda, we've actually found the language of human security has linked very well for them. So when they're talking about their rights, their social, economic, political rights, they've been able to link it into the language of human security. I feel secure. My political security is about my ability to talk in my village meeting, in the district advisory council. So they've been able to link it. And in fact, it's been a safer space despite the, the reality of our politics in Fiji. FemLink has worked to translate 1325, not just in the literal sense, but to operationalize 1325 to demonstrate the opportunities that exist at the policy level, at the community level, and within our women's networks with the benefits of transitional links and support. So obviously from the stories that we're documenting from what women are saying through the community radio broadcasts, women's security is all encompassing. It's not just related to armed conflict or even to domestic violence, but it affects every area of women's lives. The question of women's security is one of the welfare and status of women, human security, and the impact of the decisions related to the military, the police, and the broader security sector. While concerns do include the elimination of violence against women, there's also a broader concern that includes the need to advocate for gender mainstreaming and relevant training for the security sector, including those being mobilized for peacekeeping operations. The importance of gender-sensitive demobilization programs, particularly for the wives of men who are being mobilized out into um, conflict zones, and for women to be engaged in the planning of humanitarian assistance. As we've heard from the stories we have documented in each of the four countries where we work, more guns, of course, do not mean security. Through women's eyes, there's a broader notion of security, one that is defined in human rather than military terms. Women most affected by guns often have the best ideas how to remove them from the community. However, successive peace support operations in our region have failed to formally engage with women, the peacemakers. Instead, numerous incentives have been provided to ex-combatants, yet the guns remain. But we persist to continue to claim our notions of peace and security. In April 2012, just over a year ago, the historical Fiji Women's Forum adopted an important parallel process to monitor and hold the state accountable to human rights conventions and treaties, including 1325 and CEDAW, the UN Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, while also enhancing collaboration between key women's organizations and networks. Women will be supported through the forum to enable and empower a higher level of participation in national political processes, especially from within our local communities. Women leaders have reaffirmed that the return to civilian-led parliamentary democracy must include security sector governance and reform as a critical issue that women must engage on. Also in April last year in Bougainville, over a thousand women and girls from various churches and community-based organizations in the 14th constituency of North Bougainville marched to Bell EC Park or Peace Park with placards and banners calling for the total disposal of arms and appealing to the autonomous Bougainville government to provide active leadership in dealing with gun issues and other law and order problems facing the region. The forum organized by Leitan and Nehan Women's Development Agency in response to the escalation of gun violence called for a rightful place, their rightful place in the weapons disposal programs. Women have called for a clear framework and timeline to collect and dispose of guns, as well as have rehabilitation programs for ex-combatants. These are just two examples of the spectrum of activities that our um, network organizes. Through the creation of both the network and communication spaces for women, women's groups and community organizations. So why community radio? Why does community radio mean peace for us? Shouldn't we be mainstreaming and making news, shaking things up in the mainstream media? I only wish it was that easy. After departing from a career in corporate media, where I was constantly trying to find ways to take the message from our women's movement 
beyond the confines of International Women's Day and 16 Days um, campaign events. It's been more than a decade since I connected my work with the vision of Virginia Woolf for women to have the resources to define our spaces, including to be able to challenge war and violence. The main objective of FemLink is to bring the stories of our women and their communities to the forefront to help promote peace and reconciliation in multi-ethnic <coughs> Fiji. Last year, because we've been organizing 16 days campaign events um, linked to our community radio station, and every year we bring together new, more young women into this community media space to engage and, and address the global theme of violence against women, but from their own young women's perspective and from their own community-based perspective. Last year, 139 rural women and 24 young women shared their personal stories, the stories of their families, their community groups and clubs during our 16 days campaign. This to us was a reaffirmation of 1325 that links together economic recovery, social cohesion and political systems. This wasn't us saying it in the capital city. This was from women and young women from the rural centers across Fiji. By using women's media, local women are empowered via the dissemination and uh, coordination of information, while listening women are connected to the same information. In 2012, the theme for the UN Security Council Open Debate on 1325 reiterated the need to support women's civil society roles in peace building and conflict prevention. And that means that local and national action plans must be inclusive of women's definitions of peace and human security. It also requires a transformation of structures to ensure the full and equal participation of women in decision making. This campaign was based around an interactive learning program for us in the context of community radio as young women got together, together with some amazing young, um, feminist um, leaders, including Vanessa Griffin and Shirley Tangi, who's been um, a radio broadcaster. So we linked the 1325 open debate once again to the 16 days campaign, and we once again found that what they were talking about, what they were claiming, were the media spaces to talk about issues closer to them, to connect to the processes, and to define where the transformation is needed, especially in Fiji during a constitutional transition. To us, this was thinking globally and acting locally. So I'd now like to link that because I think, not I think, I know that the media content that we've been able to generate, particularly from 2007 to 2010, has been the bedrock for us to be able to engage around the development of the Regional Action Plan on Women, Peace and Security. Um, to be able to work with the Pacific Islands Forum and to be able to particularly engage to, with the Forum Regional Security Committee. It simply required me to ask a question back in 2004, like, we have the Security Council at the United Nations, what do we have in the Pacific? Ah, it's the FRSC, <laughs> the Forum Regional Security. Really, there's such a thing? How do we get involved? Oh, no, 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 you can't. Why? And well, women, women, peace and security is not on the agenda. Right, we'll make it the agenda. So we started, you just have to ask the question, don't you? And then you give them the content. So it's, it's a fabulous way of using media skills at the end of the day, actually. The Regional Action Plan, um, which was launched by the chair of the Pacific Forum um, on October 18, provides a framework for Pacific Island countries to enhance women's leadership in conflict prevention and peace building, to mainstream gender in security policy making, and ensure women and girls and human rights are protected in humanitarian crises. So we were able to link a number of the experiences, particularly around preventive action, which we thought is where we want to enhance our participation. We wanted to prevent the resurgence of violence that we had experienced in Fiji, in Bougainville, in Solomons, and in Tonga. So that was our collective story. We wanted to also ensure that we were part of the decision-making where policy was being framed, because this is the, the meeting that regional security officials come and talk about these issues. And we also wanted to be able to link 1325, as we had seen particularly in the Asian context, 
to humanitarian assistance and to start applying 1325 into that context because of the vulnerability to um, natural disasters like cyclones, but also more and more Pacific leaders themselves are t starting to link climate change and other human secu uh, environmental security issues to the security agenda themselves. So that's what we've been able to do. So the first focus of the plan is on gender mainstreaming and women's leadership in conflict prevention. It's, an op it's basically saying to the Pacific Forum Secretary General, you have a responsibility under a number of treaties to be nominating women to positions of leadership as special envoys, as diplomats, as decision makers on regional issues. But you haven't been doing that. Why? Because you said you don't know where the women are. So we're going to show you where the women are. So it's about saying this is the work that we can do as civil society to identify, to equip women and young women as well. One of the best things I think about this regional action plan is it's not just about this generation of work, but it's an intergenerational piece of work because we're saying that the legacy we want to leave behind for our daughters, our younger sisters in the Pacific is peace and security. So the peace and security agenda around participation is very much about linking young women's participation, just as we've done with our model of work in working with young women. It is a problem when women are not in um, political spaces, but I also think this is an opportunity for us to challenge notions around, is it just about women in parliament? I'd say right now in Fiji, <laughs> <laughs> who wants to get into Parliament, <laughs> but <laughs> constitutionally speaking. But aside from that, our focus is really on local government. That's where local leadership is right now. That's where the women are. And that's where we need to see the changes in governance, in governance systems at the sub-national level, where we can get women identified and well-equipped to be in district advisory councils, where the women are ready, willing, and able to be in the Bosivakoro, the village settlement, the village meetings, and to get women into divisional planning meetings. That's where we can strengthen women's participation in political processes. And yes, those women who are ready, willing, and able to co contest national parliamentary elections, let them. And as we've said at the Women's Forum, we will support women who want to enter that, that realm of politics. But let's not lose sight of where the women are, and also from a conflict prevention perspective, where we can do better work in preventing conflict. So we have a series of recommendations that it's really important to shift from commitments to operationalization, both of 1325 and of CEDAW, the UN Convention, to ensure effective response to the complex and multifaceted threats and challenges of human security in the Pacific. An effective response requires participation, recognition, and valuing the experience of women and the role of women. I have to just tell you this story. We've been, as I said, district advisory councils are very, very important at the local level. We're constantly trying to unearth the terms of reference. We were told by a district officer, well, you know, they kind of have to be educated. Really? You're assuming that the women in this meeting right now, I was in, in, in a town up in the second main island in Vanuelev, I was in Lambasa, for those of you who know Fiji, and so they were, they were assuming that all these women, 30 plus women leaders, had never been to school, um, and, and actually we knew that several of the district advisory councillors didn't actually write the letters. They were getting their wives to write the letters. So, you know, <laughs> let's, let's, let's even it out a little. So it's very important for us to be challenging the status quo to make sure that we know, we, you know, and, and to be able to engage and, and bring women into these spaces. I think what's also important is the role of women's civil society. It needs to be linked to any peace plan. We've seen what women have contributed in, in, you know, in the countries where we're working and across the Pacific. We see it at the global level as well. But too often we're not in the formal process. And the question is no longer the why, but how are you going to get us in? And the responsibility of governments like Australia with the National Action Plan to ensure that in peace building, peace support operations, women are there as well. 
because you can't keep doing this. You can't just keep um, forgetting that the women are there or valuing the combatants over the peacemakers. I think it's, it's very important to be able to ensure that women's notions of peace and security are in there. I'm going to skip very quickly to the issue of the media as well, because I think it's also really important for us to understand the political constructs in which the media is operating. I will use Fiji as an example, where right now we have a lot of st state-sanctioned media operating. Um, and so it's very important to start valuing more and more community media, particularly a radio in the Pacific. While we, there's a lot of talk about social media, we also want to make sure that it's participatory and it's inclusive, so particularly for rural communities. As we know, peace processes do more than end conflict, but it's also about building a foundation for nation building and restoring community life. And it's important that women who are active agents of transformation are part of all of these processes. We should be also included in discussions about security and about resource allocation. Too often the women's answers to these questions are not heard because we're ex excluded from the process or our contributions and opinions are devalued. To overcome these obstacles to an effective and just nation building, women's, society, women's civil society representation must be deliberately and systematically included in any peace building process, including defining peace keeping and peace support operations. I think while we do have a regional action plan now for women, peace and security, the next step at the regional level is not just the operationalization and resourcing of the regional action plan, but there's now a very critical role to start also reviewing regional commitments such as the Bikatawa Declaration to ensure that this commitment by Pacific Forum leaders to women, peace and security is not just seen as a standalone issue to do with women and peace and security, but integrated into regional peace and security architecture. Otherwise, it'll be just another piece of work. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. We have about 20 minutes for questions, so I'd like to open the floor to anyone who has a question for Sharon this evening. And we have a microphone. This lady here. You mentioned that it's very hard to get into mainstream media, but as, as coming from a community radio perspective, do you still face challenges and censorship? Mm -hmm. And in can Fiji. you give a few examples, perhaps? Um, in Fiji, as a community media operator, we do have to comply with the media decree. We operate by a simple rule, keep Sharon out of jail card. No, um, well, we couldn't afford the $50,000 fine. I couldn't work my Blackberry in jail. Uh, <laughs> um, so um, when, they, uh, when, when the state lifted the public emergency regulation, um, we were then told that we didn't have to send our broadcast logs and other information pre-print, pre-broadcast. Um, but yeah, now with, with, with the, the media decree in place, everyone's playing, being very careful, particularly in the mainstream. So you have very clear, that's why I was talking about state sanctioned media, because you have the Fiji Broadcasting Corporation gets $1.6 million grant every year, uncontested. There is one particular newspaper that the state chooses to use for their advertising and publications. The other two commercial organizations are just trying to survive. One, you know, has had uh, the publisher in jail for a while, but there's still uh, a warrant out for him while he's on medical treatment. Um, so I actually believe that community radio right now is providing the public service type content. I think one of the ways it, community radio has actually been able to be a safer space for us as Femlink in our work because our advocacy is grounded in what the women are saying. So if you're broadcasting what rural women are saying, it's their voices, their language. It's their issues last year during the constitution making process that were saying, we want temporary 
special measures, we want 50-50. It wasn't me saying it. You could listen to them, but we also did um, TV simulcast, so you could see them as well. So it's been a very important space. We do have to manage it, but that's the language of peace building as well. You are also speaking in a way that's going to prevent conflict. And we're actually strengthening the, work, the voices of these very women who we've been working with over time. So some of them are, are much stronger activists and advocates, I'd say. They should be giving this lecture. Does that answer your question? Ruth Russell from Wilf. Uh, I wonder if you could make a comment because I don't really know anything about what good outcomes, what are the outcomes from the Australian government's long time Ramsey intervention in the Solomon Islands in relation to women, peace and security? Um, it took them a while to get a gender advisor. That was our 1325 lobbying. I mean, that was one of the things we were saying from the outset of the network was that you've got this regional assistance mission, but how are you engaging with the very women? So we used the stories. I mean, I think really at the end of the day, it's for the people of the Solomon Islands, not for me to comment. I mean, I, I, I have an issue about um, any type of support operation that's not involved women from the start. Um, but I think one has to ensure that there's an avoidance or reliance on the mission. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a very important need to get more women into those spaces of this, this very discussion. Solomon Islands women need to be analysing the entire regional assistance mission. I mean, that's why the Foreign Regional Security Committee is so important, because Ramsey is on the agenda every time but who's in that space discussing it. So think also around, um, as civil society, we also need to be taking advantage of those spaces. And, and so with Women, Peace and Security now on the agenda for the Regional Security Committee, one would hope that missions like Ramsey and others would also be linked, linked into the Women, Peace and Security agenda that the member states of the forum are also reporting around women, peace and security as well. So that's why the regional action plan is going to be so important, because at least it's giving them a framework to start talking about women, peace and security, or peace and security using a 1325 lens. Uh, uh, Sharon, thank you so much for this opportunity that uh, I, I mean, can meet you and uh, listen more about the progress in Pacific. I'm Rika from West Papua. I have a question regarding the um, uh, 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 regional, the region that become concern of the families, and um, there is no Papua New Guinea in that uh, list. Um, um, I was wondering that uh, whether you put uh, a concern on the um, effort by the Papua New Guinea um, women's. Uh, to um, include in the uh, parliament seat, um, whether it is, is it um, a part of the uh, uh, conflict prevention? And um, the, the second question is not question, but just like proposal. If you cross a little bit to Papua New Guinea, then it's easy for us to cross the border and come to yeah. uh, to other side and get involved in the in the network. And then my second question is whether you put uh, attention on the peace process in several places like West Papua in New Caledonia. Um, yeah, New Caledonia will become uh, next uh, year, uh, and uh, yeah, West Papua is still on the process to get into the board. But um, my question, because you know the context that we can cross the ocean to the uh, to uh, to Asia part, but we are really uh, looking for the support from the uh, Pacific region. Thank you. Okay, um, West Papua. So I'll just give you a little bit of background on our network, um, on the 1325 network. It actually stemmed initially from a project from Unifem Pacific. Um, when 1325 was adopted, the Women, Peace and Security agenda for the Pacific Island region focused on Melanesia because of the experiences within Melanesia. So there was Fiji, Solomon's, 
Bougainville, Papua New Guinea, and Vanuatu. Um, when FemLink um, got our first funding for the 1325 network, we had those four countries because through UNIFEM, which is now UN Women's Work, we had come together as a network to kind of discuss and look at the 1325 framework. Um, and there'd been an affirmation, particularly from the women in Bougainville and Solomons, to, to link up and to continue collaborating, and, and particularly through the use of media. Now, the Women, Peace and Security Project finished, I think um, it was a very short timeline. And, and so we just stayed in touch um, until we got our first annual grant. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, from Ozaid Canberra, and they, they were our benefactors for a couple of years. But um, so it was actually defined by that. And we were working across common experiences, which was post-conflict, and the prevention of the resurgence of violence. And in fact, November 2006, as we were just finalizing the project, the riots happened in Tonga. And um, a number of us had been connected already through the Thousand Peace Women Project. So I picked up the phone and spoke to our colleague, Betty Blake, in Tonga, and said, look, we're developing something. Do you want to work? Can we work with you? We need to understand what happened in Tonga and how do we prevent this from happening. So our focus has always been women's participation for the resurgence of, of conflict. For us, it had been trying to prevent the riots of, of May 19th, 2000. So that's the context of our network. So we do have Bougainville um, in Papua New Guinea, and we also work now through the Global Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflict Network in these countries as well, but also in, um, in mainland Papua New Guinea through Peace Foundation Melanesia. Um, on the West Papua question, um, apart from meeting women from West Papua through different peace networks, no, we haven't gone into that area, as I said, because we're, we're taking a slightly different approach on, on prevention, but we are willing to work in solidarity. So I think one of the things I need to do is also check to see, because I know our colleagues from the Philippines and South Asia, Southeast Asia and GPAC have been working with you. But we have also, I mean, recently through different networks putting out messages of solidarity. And, and the West Papua movement has also been lobbying around the Melanesian Spearhead group as well. But I'm only hearing men, not the women of West Papua. So maybe we, this is where we can support you. But I think what's really important in, in these kinds of campaigns is to, for you to come together to, to have a strong voice. Um, for the Fiji Women's Forum, it took us six years since the, you know, after the military coup to convene as the Women's Forum because we had to negotiate through so many different political positions, but we're there to support. I don't know how much more we could do um, specifically for West Papua, but I'm sure we can keep talking and, and stay in touch. Uh, hi, Sharon. It's uh, Daphne Cook here from ACFID. Uh, in a previous role, I worked with people with disabilities in Australia. We yes. did quite a lot of work with the Pacific Disability Forum and the Network <coughs> of Women with Disabilities in um, the Pacific. And I was just wondering, um, when you were talking about inclusion and sort of active inclusion of women in um, peace and security debates, if there's an active inclusion of the networks of um, disabled people's organisations and women. Absolutely. For, I can only speak for FemLink Pacific. We've had a partnership with the Women in Disability Network of the Fiji Disabled People's Association since our very early days. Um, and we made several documentaries in collaboration with the Women in Disability Network, particularly to, um, to get them to talk about the issues themselves, rather than me as an able-bodied person assuming things. Um, I've often said that the second documentary I did around women talking about their rights and access through a CEDAW lens was probably the longest time I've ever spent in pre-production because it took about two years of just getting to know them in order to be able to ask questions, particularly around sexual reproductive health rights issues. Um, with community radio, we've very purposefully used an analog style console because we have uh, young women with visual impairment as producers and broadcasters. 
Um, so we now have two who are part of our production team out of Suva, and one of our network members in Nandi is also a young woman. She's the vice president of the Nandi Disability Network. She's a regular contributor to radio and television programs, but also just part of the process. So um, recently we had an interactive dialogue with the town council, and so she's basically got them changing a few things on disability and access for persons with visual impairment. So yes, we really see that as, an op as a platform for them to use. Yeah. I wanted to just ask you about the audience for the public radio um, projects and how much you see that as about creating a network among women and how much these programs are being listened to by men as well. And I guess I'm interested in that partly because I think one of the things that feminists often confront is that although you create a network of women, you still end up with a marginalised woman's voice because it's dismissed as simply being the women's point of view or simply a feminist perspective. And I wondered how you address that in your work. Um, it's all about the process. So um, Suva's been a very different type of broadcasting. We do deliberately Women's Weekend Radio. Um, when we were developing the project, that was the, the idea from UNESCO. We didn't want to compete with the 24-hour radio stations. We certainly didn't have the infrastructure. And the focus was more on developing a core group of producers and broadcasters, which I believe we have now. Um, in the rural community, the broadcast is actually defined, or the broadcast hours were very much defined by the women themselves. They've told us the hours to broadcast. So they're, they're involved in producing programs ahead of the broadcast. Um, they get on the radio. They know when their shows are going to be on air. And what we found is that the local community, because it's in a 10-kilometer radius, are actually tuning in. And when we've done the 16 Days campaign as well, um, They've come on in, they've gone back into the community and, and got people switching on and listening to the radio as well. So that's been quite important. Um, commercial audience survey company told me, you'd never afford me. <laughs> but she also said that um, w with the kind of broadcasting that we're doing, um, we've probably got about 1% of an audience. But somebody once said, if 1% if of the people want to make the change, that's the 1% you want to be talking to. Um, we do have plans, particularly because um, we recognize that there isn't much in the way of public service radio content out there anymore. Um, so we've recently started a morning show called Morning Waves with young women in a sort of big system mentoring program, which we launched for International Women's Day. And that's the result of, of a project we've been um, in partnership with the International Women's Development Agency called Generation Next. So it's building, so the focus has been to build the cadre of producer broadcasters to make the content, to deliver the content. So that's in Suva. In the north, where we have our second radio station, we have five young women running that station. Um, once again, it's a 10 kilometer radius. We know the men are listening because the wives are telling us that their husbands have listened to, to the show. But once again, it's, it's, it's defined by the community planning, the, the being involved. And the stories come from beyond the 10-kilometer 20 20, uh, 10 kilometer radius. So women coming in from 25 kilometers out of town to participate in the whole process, to have their stories produced, and then they go back because they want to be heard. from Jose um, Sekondi at the Australian Civil Military Centre. Um, one of the hardest things for us to understand is um, women in the Pacific. Um, when we meet women from the Pacific, they're wonderful, strong individuals. Um, but in, in their own cultures, they often don't have the formal structures of, of power. So the, the informal structures are the ones that they have to use in some of the Pacific cultures rather than the formal structures of power because of the sort of patriarchy that's been built over the traditional cultures. And I'm just wondering whether you have any comments on that. Um, when 
it, it's a bit hard to say women of the Pacific because I think each country, each settlement or each village, and then in Fiji, we're, we're, we're not a homogenized group either, so we're very diverse. But um, when we were doing our very first um, documentary called Not Just Sweet Talk, we were interviewing older women, younger women, and one of the older women told me how, as an Itoke woman, she uses her traditional structures and systems. She says, I don't have to reach my chi. So we've, we've often unpacked that and looked at it. So that's why I was talking about local level governance and the need to utilize um, traditional systems. So we have a number of women in one of our rural networks quite involved in the village planning because one, they've organized through the women's, our 1325 network, through their own clubs, they've got the information. They take it, they're talking to the village headman, they're, they're negotiating, they're involved. They're being seen for being recognized on television or being able to talk on the radio, articulate their community issues. So um, I think there's some good, good ways in which we can negotiate those those structures. So the structures are there. I think it's how we we can utilize it and what approach you use. You can totally discard it and stay on the outside, but for us it's been about conflict transformation. So how do you how do you address and make those changes? So we're looking at building women's leadership, building women's capacity to communicate and be the advocates for their own issues. So I think it's that's the option, and maybe we need to be, as I said earlier, not just looking at the national structures, but actually looking at those local level governance structures, um, the subnational, to be able to get women involved and to support them in their leadership. No, I just say, and, and don't forget the faith-based communities. Very important. I'm afraid we've run out of time, everyone. <laughs> Um, but I'd just like to thank Sharon very much for a terrific talk which has given us a lot to think about and talk about for the Civil Society Dialogue today and tomorrow. Um, but can you all please join me in thanking